Hi, and welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement here at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our fall series on uh, Six Days Shall You Labor, Jewish um, Perspectives on Work in Jewish Text and Tradition. And I'm feeling sad because we only have two sessions left to this series, but um, today will not disappoint, I can promise you. Um, we're so pleased to have Professor David Fishman teaching us today. His session is entitled, When Matzah Bakers and Talas Weavers Went Out on Strike, the Jewish Workers' Movement in Russia. Um, so thank you, Professor Fishman, for teaching us today. Thanks to everyone for joining us and special welcome to anyone who may be joining us for the first time today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, an anonymous donor at the Fafam level who has sponsored today's session. Thank you so much. Um, to that donor for your for your generous support, um, and for anyone else who is feeling inspired by this amazing lear learning with JTS scholars, we invite you to partner with us by sponsoring a learning session. We have three levels, as you've heard me say many times: um, Chacham, Sadiq, and Navi for uh, five hundred forty one thousand and eighteen hundred dollars, respectively. And you can learn more by emailing learninglives at jtsa.edu. Um, I want to give you a, a sneak peek might be too, um, too strong a sentence, a, a phrase, but um, I guess announce that we are already planning our spring series. We're so excited about it. Um, the theme for the spring is going to be um, emotions in, um, in Jewish texts and Jewish thought. It's I'm very excited about it. It will really be wonderful. And as you, as usual, showcase a huge um, breadth of JTS faculty teaching uh, from their areas of expertise. We're going to take a bit of a break before that series and we'll be starting on um, January 24th. So we'll have about a month off um, after this week and next week's session of the fall series. So hope you find other wonderful learning to do on Mondays, but then we hope you come back to us. Um, all right, on that note, I turn it over to Tani for a couple of announcements. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so just to go over um, the Q&A for today's session, uh, Dr. Fishman will pause periodically throughout the session. Um, and um, we ask you to please chat your questions to Rabbi Andelman, um, and she will select a few to present to Dr. Fishman. Um, for any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or Lynn Feynman. Um, the PowerPoint presentation that uh, Dr. Fishman will be sharing uh, during today's session is now available on the series uh, page. Um, we will, and I think we also shared a link in, in the chat. We will continue to share um, a link in the chat as well. Um, so pleased to um, introduce uh, Dr. David Fishman, a professor of Jewish history at JTS. Um, as, as Julia mentioned, um, you know, he's taught for us uh, several times um, during the series, and we're so pleased to have him back. Um, Dr. Fishman also serves as director of Project Judaica, JTS's program in the former Soviet Union. Dr. Fishman is the author of numerous books and articles on the history and culture of East European Jewry. His most recent book, The Book Smug Smugglers, Partisans, Poets, and the Race to Save Jewish Treasures from the Nazis has won awards and received broad praise and recognition. Um, please to turn it over to Dr. Fishman. Okay, thank you, Tani. And uh, thank you to Community Engagement for inviting me to participate in this uh, series. Um, as Tani said, I'm going to keep the format of presenting to you for about um, 20, 25 minutes, then taking a break for questions in 20, 25 minutes. We'll do it three times. I think each of those units, I'll conclude with a song, not me singing, but I've actually got recordings of songs from the Jewish labor movement. Um, I'm taking you back in history to a time 120 years ago, more or less, between 130 and 100 years ago. Uh, the generation of my grandparents, for some of you also probably grandparents or great grandparents, it's a time when a lot of Jews were um, manual laborers and wage earners. When I grew up, you know, I, my mother would take me to a Jewish tailor to get my uh, clothes 
my suit, my new suit uh, tailored. Now I don't think you can find a Jewish tailor, at least in, uh, not so easy in New York. Uh, my grandfather made pocketbooks. So this is a different world than the Jewish world today as far as the socioeconomic class um, of Jews, and especially because we're talking about uh, Russia where Jews were um, poorer than uh, they ever were in America. And I'm gonna uh, talk mainly showing you images and slides um, so that um, to make this a bit more um, vivid. Just bear with me a minute. I want to make this a, a slideshow. Dr. Fishman, oh, thank you. Let me unmute you. Okay, thank you for bearing with me with the technical difficulties. Um, um, I think if you hit, do you wanna try hitting slideshow at the top there? And that's a problem because it's blocked. Um, if you can, that would be great. If, if not, I, I can, I can. Let me try this. If you'd like, I can share it ah, for you. I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, you can. Okay. Here I am. Thank you for bearing with me. OK, <laughs> this is a map of the Pale of Settlement. I'm taking you back to Russia 120 years ago. Um, the Pale of Settlement was the region in Russia, in Imperial Russia, Tsarist Russia, where Jews were allowed to live. So this map. The Pale of Settlement, uh, you know, going from the north near the Baltic Sea to the south near the Black Sea. This is where about five and a half million Jews lived at the turn of the 20th century. It did not include, however, the Pale of Settlement, Trum HaMoyshev, Trum HaMoshav, the most, the biggest and most dynamic cities in Russian life. Namely, you can see St. Petersburg here, which was not in the Pale. And you can't even see on the map Moscow because it's beyond. Jews couldn't, or very, only very wealthy Jews, uh, rare Jews, could live in St. Petersburg and Moscow. And the story of the Pale of Settlement is uh, in the 19th century is one of increasing impoverishment um, and uh, also of internal migration. Uh, the occupations that Jews once had were no longer viable. Uh, a lot of Jews used to work in the transport business, you know, with wagons and with carts and moving things from here to there. But once the railway came along, Jews, you know, there wasn't as need as much need for wagons and carts. So there went the Jewish transport business. Jews used to manage estates for the Polish nobility, for the nobility. But once the peasants were liberated and became farmers in their own right, the, the emancipation of the serfs, you didn't need Jews to manage estates. So Jews ended up moving to the bigger cities um, where there was these new opportunities, at least for some form of employment. And many of them became workers, <laughs> manual laborers, cobblers, <laughs> smiths, um, I'll come back to that. Seamstresses, uh, that is, and you can see the uh, sewing machine there on the right-hand corner, or even tanners that is working with leather. And this was not a um, great kind of work because <laughs> Jews were working in shops, very long hours, um, <laughs> very low wages. Usually a lot of workers actually slept in the workplace in Russia. Uh, they couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Um, the work day was, um, well, 14 hours a day was not uncommon. Uh, in the early Jewish strikes, one of the demands was a 12 hour day, a 12 hour work day. Um, again, people moved to the cities and took on this kind of work, not really because they wanted to, because it was the only work that was available to them. This was downward social mobility. Um, I should say that these workers worked 
in a kind of Jewish sub-economy. What I mean by that is if it was a shop, let's say producing um, clothing, socks, or let's say take another kind of shop, uh, cigarettes, tobacco, you know, you had mechanized production, you had hundreds of uh, or dozens of people working. And it was a Jewish sub-economy by which I mean that the, the owner, the boss, uh, the entrepreneur was Jewish and all the workers were Jewish. This was almost a necessity in, in Russia because of Shabbos, because of Shabbat. I mean, only a Jewish employer would set up a business so that Saturday wasn't a working day. So you had Jewish workers working for Jewish um, businessmen. And the Jewish workers movement I'm gonna talk about became known as the Bund, which means alliance. The full name was the Jewish Workers Alliance of Russia, Poland, and Lithuania. And it was founded in 1897 um, in this little house in Vilna. Um, the same year, 1897, as the World Zionist Organization. And these two movements will be rivals, the Jewish Socialist Movement, the Labor and Socialist Movement, and the Zionist Movement will be rivals for much of the beginning of the uh, first half of the 20th century. Now, really the Bund's activity falls into three areas. One is economic, what it called economic struggle. And I'm just gonna lay this out and then go into each one in detail, uh, which is um, organizing trade unions, organizing strikes. <laughs> the second was political struggle which is much bigger arena, which is uh, uh, planning for a revolution to topple the czar and to eventually bring down the whole political system and to create a democratic and socialist Russia. And the third arena of activity for this movement, we can call Jewish activity. It is struggling for Jewish rights, for Jewish dignity, um, strengthening Jewish culture, secular culture in Yiddish. Um, and um, uh, so, and eventually looking forward to a Russia that would be uh, very different and much better for Jews. Uh, to put this in a broad sense, I will say, uh, the Bund and Zionism were rivals in the sense that the Bund thought the solution to Jews problems in Russia was not to leave um, but instead, not to leave for America or not to leave for the land of Israel, but the solution was to struggle to change the place where they lived, to transform the country where they lived into a much better and brighter place. Um, that is sort of the overall. This is what you're looking at now is a picture of Arkady Kremer, often referred to as the father of the Bund. Um, he was born in, Lithu in the region known as Lithuania. He went to university in St. Petersburg. He was um, fortunate enough to get into a university because later there'll be uh, strict quotas on Jews going to university in Russia. In university, he will be exposed to socialist ideas. He'll read Marx in Russian translation. Um, and then after finishing university, he actually goes back to his native land inside the Pale of Settlement. And he is the one who has the idea of really spreading socialist ideas among Jews in Yiddish, um, in their native tongue, and among Jewish workers. On the right is his book on agitation in Russian, um, which really talked about how to organize workers. Um, <clears throat> because the idea of, of the Bund was the first thing you do is you organize workers for their immediate needs uh, into trade unions. Um, and now that's um, a big deal because in Russia, all kinds of un trade unions were illegal. Organizing workers was by definition illegal in Russia. All the activity of the Bund was done underground and illegally. Unlike the Zionist movement, which was a public movement, the Bund, at least till 1905, um, was uh, an underground movement. I showed you the picture. It was founded in the attic of a little house in Vilna. Everything had to be done in secret, 
including um, this kind of propaganda and agitation among workers. And I, the most interesting book is the one here on the right, right? A Passover Haggadah, Haggadah Shel Pesach Al Pinush Chadash, but it's, as you can say, if you can read, Aroiski Geben from the Malgemeinim Yiddish and Arbeter Bund in Russland, published by the book. It's not a real Haggadah. Instead, it uses selected sections from the Haggadah in order to really spread the uh, idea of liberation, right? And it, it's very interesting because how do you spread socialism among workers? You've got to Judaize it. You've got to present it in terms that Jewish workers can understand. And that means, for instance, to say, our plight as Jewish workers is like the slaves in Egypt. The capitalists are like Pharaoh. We have to liberate ourselves just like they did um, in ancient times. That simplifies the matter in a way that a simple Jewish worker, someone that hasn't had many years of education, can get the idea immediately. Um, and that's much of what the Bund did in the 1890s, uh, was um, spread these basic ideas that the workers have to organize, they need strike funds, um, they are entitled to dignity, they are entitled to a, a decent wage, decent hours. And, but the most difficult thing the Bund had to teach people, um, it was the idea of class conflict or class contradictions in Jewish society. That the Jewish businessman and the Jewish worker in many ways are not allies and are not friends. They have contradictory interests and Jewish workers have to um, struggle against their employers and make demands of their employers. This was a very hard uh, idea to spread among Jewish workers, but the Bund was able to gradually get that idea across. Um, I'm showing you here pictures of early Bundish periodicals, Jewish labor period. This is a worker carrying the banner, the red banner of the movement, and trying to wake up from his slumber, a fellow worker who has not become class conscious, right? And so the Bund uses Yiddish, because it's the only language Jewish workers knew in Eastern Europe, at least the only one they could read. If they knew Russian, it was very rudimentary. If they knew Hebrew, it was you know, to recite things from the Sidur, but they didn't really understand it. So initially the Bund uses Yiddish simply as a um, practical, practical matter. But with the course of time, the Bund will come to embrace Yiddish as, an, as a value as something that, as a Jewish value, as something that needs to be perpetuated and strengthened and taken pride in. But initially it's simply a um, practical tool. I will mention that the workplace was integrated. You saw women, a lot of these factories and shops had both men and women, uh, and women begin to play a very prominent role in the Jewish labor movement and in the Bund. Um, in general, it's socialist movements in Eastern Europe where women for the first time take on roles of leadership. Um, these are two women who were prominent in the Bund, Patya Kremer on the, on the right and, and Esther Frumkin on the left. Uh, women play Im important roles as smugglers. Uh, you had to smuggle in a lot of underground literature. It was published abroad and then smuggled across the border. Um, the Tsarist police was less strict as far as body searches with women than with men. And therefore the Bund took advantage of that and uh, used a whole network of, of, of uh, female smugglers. And more generally, uh, it was the socialist milieu where women were at least in principle um, considered equals and can, and were served on the central committee of the, uh, of the movement um, uh, to make an analogy. Uh, for instance, Golda Meir uh, arose in a socialist Zionist milieu. So it is the movements of the left where the women's issue um, is very much an important issue and they are trying uh, to implement a kind of equality um, in the movement, not always fully, not always successfully, but nonetheless um, much more than had been in previous movements in Jewish life. And um, I think to wrap up sort of this beginning um, section on 
the economic struggles of the Bund. The Bund was very successful as far as the strike movement, stunningly so. Um, they won most of the strikes they, um, they ran in, in the Russian empire. And yes, to, I, my title is no exaggeration, a uh, very important kind of strike were, you know, matzah bakers. Matzah bakers, and they were often uh, women, uh, you know, endless hours, rushed work, produce more, more and more. And therefore we have proclamations of, uh, of workers protesting about the way matzah is being produced in Vilna and other cities. And these proclamations, just to give you a sense of Jewish milieu, you know, are hung up Friday night when all pious Jews are at home having the Shabbat meal. Uh, the Bundes are going to, you know, and, and pasting on these placards uh, on synagogue walls and other places. People wake up Shabbat morning and they read the proclamation. If they're religious, they're not even going to tear it down because that would be violation of Shabbat. And the placards will say, do not eat the matzah by this and this bakery. It is treif. In fact, and this is even invoking the... Um, the blood libel indirectly, it will say, do not eat this matzah. It is baked with Jewish blood, the blood of Jewish women and workers who have been uh, abused and exploited. And this is a stunning new phenomenon in Jewish life of, of workers um, organizing, protesting and demanding uh, different treatment of workers. So to wrap up this section, I want to play a song, which is actually, in a, uh, it's from the early, uh, very early years, even pre-Bund, uh, which is an appeal to women, to female workers, um, <clears throat> to, um, to join the movement, to join the struggle. Okay, I think, Tani, I'm going to ask you to play that song, if you can. Can you? Sure. Wait, just tell me which which one. It's are called you Arbiter Freud. Okay, sure. And I will meanwhile show the um, the text of this song. I'm not sure if I can if I can play if I can share it. Well, I don't know if we can both share at the same okay, time. Okay, I will have to share the text. Thank we you. Don't, we don't need the share. Okay. This is a, a current rendition of the song, a modern rendition, and a little bit of the rendition is in English, and some of it's in the original Yiddish. Okay. I I seem to be, I'm sorry, I seem to be having an issue, but can you see the, the YouTube? Yes, we can all see okay. it. Okay, okay. Arbeite freuen, leidende freuen, freuen, wo schmachten in Häus und Fabrik, wo steht ihr von Weiden, wo helft ihr nicht beugen, im Tempel von der Freiheit, von menschlichen Glück. Helft uns drum, dem Wander, dem Reuten, vorwärts durch Sturm, durch finstere Nacht. Helft uns, Wahrheit und Licht zu verspreiten, zwischen umwiesende Ellen.
thank you. Thank you, Tan, for helping. I think I'm gonna take the first break now to respond if there are to questions in the chat. Okay, wonderful. Um, the most popular category of questionnaire has to do with non-Jews. I'm, I'm just gonna read all of them to you and you can um, sift out. Um, so um, a few people ask, were there non-Jewish equivalents of the of the Bund and did, did those come first or what's their precedent there? Um, people asked about, um, were they striking against Jewish employers or were they ever striking against non-Jewish bosses um, and were non-Jews um, participating in, um, in these labor protests as well? Those are kind of the three, um, the, the three um, core aspects of, of this family of questions about um, you know, the, the larger picture of non-Jews in this context. Oh. Okay, thank you. That's really important questions. Um, of course, there were non-Jewish um, equivalents, um, both labor organizations and and socialist movements. Um, main Russian. Uh, it's a very mixed ethnic area, so Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, <laughs> even Ukrainian. Um, what I would say, however, the Jewish movement was much more organized, much more effective than the Russian movement, mainly because Jewish workers had some level of literacy. Jewish workers uh, could read Yiddish, and a lot of Russian workers were uh, functionally illiterate. So it was very hard to spread these ideas um, among, uh, let's say, Russian coal miners or you know, steel workers. And Jewish workers were, were um, open to ideas, and therefore the Bund was actually in terms of number of uh, workers who belong to the movement, much larger than the Russian party. There are a lot more Russians out there than Jews, but the, the Bund was a very, so, uh, and uh, the, uh, okay, I'll leave it at that. Uh, generally, it's a Jewish sub-economy. That is Jews are employed by Jews and strike against Jews. And that's the whole image that's so powerful of Jews striking against Jews. And of course, those who oppose this movement will say, but what about Jewish solidarity? What about Kalal Yisrael? We're all brothers. And the Bund actually has to teach an idea, which is really hard. It says, in some ways we're brothers, in some ways we're not brothers. Um, and when it comes to this you know, economic realm, uh, we Jewish workers are being exploited by Jewish employers. Um, fundamentally, maybe the most important thing to say about non-Jews is um, this movement is on, on a certain level optimistic that in the free future, there will be more friendship and solidarity between workers and socialists uh, uh, across ethnic lines. In other words, that Jewish workers and Russian workers and Polish workers will realize their shared interest and their shared ideals and will work together. Uh, that's quite utopian and it didn't, uh, but that is the hope and that is what's driving them. Uh, Jewish workers alone cannot create a revolution in Russia and cannot change the whole system. Um, they cannot, you know, but, but together, Jewish workers, Russian workers, Polish workers can do things together. I think that's the answer. Thank you. Um, another uh, popular family of questions here is about um, religious observance. So were, were religious Jews involved in the movement? Was the movement anti-religious? That's a big question. <laughs> um, I'll try to be as brief as possible. A lot of Jewish workers in the 1890s, when this movement takes off, I'd say most Jewish workers were religiously observant. They went to shul on Shabbos, they kept kosher, um, etc. cetera. Um, the leadership of this movement was quite secular and in fact, secularist. In other words, like any good Marxist, they believed um, religion was uh, the opium of the masses, in other words, a kind of drug that takes you away from reality. It, it, it distracts you from reality, it puts you in some kind of uh, limbo. And so they actually thought that religion per se is a harmful thing. Um, 
However, the Bundists were no fools and they understood that spreading anti-religion will only antagonize most Jewish workers. And therefore, while they were very secularist, they did not actively <laughs> spread you know, anti-religious propaganda among the workers. In fact, they, they quite were tolerant. Their belief was give the workers time and then in, in, over the course of years, they will become, as they become more educated and enlightened, they'll become less attached to this religious stuff. Uh, again, it was a very broad and, and complicated question because the question often became, what is the boundary between Jewish religion and Jewish culture? You know, so that the Bund would often say, yeah, Jews have our holidays, but that's our cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. That's not religious, you know? Han uh, so that Hanukkah, uh, Bundists would not object to lighting candles. They would object to saying a blessing because they didn't think there was a God. And that, but lighting candles, what's wrong with that? It's a nice holiday. Uh, Purim is nice to, so they would all, you can have uh, a masquerade and a ball and masks and that's fun, it's uh, Mardi Gras, it's, um, but so often the Bund would support Jewish culture, which for them meant traditions of different kinds, but not religion per se. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, a few people asked about whether there was um, whether it was dangerous to engage in these activities. For example, um, if unions were illegal, were, were police breaking up these protests or strikes? Was it was it dangerous to print and distribute uh, these kinds of materials? Yes. The short answer is yes. Um, and the the whole romance of the movement is its underground nature and its dangerous nature. And most of the activists were quite young late teens and 20s, um, yes, uh, police beat up <laughs> um, strikers and, and workers, um, and all the printing presses were underground. You know, there were local printing press. They moved from house to house. Meetings were taking place. There, might, there were safe houses, but usually you had to have meetings in places like the forest, outside of town. In other words, this is a very, um, Yes, the, the excitement of the movement is precisely its, uh, and its heroism is its uh, dangerous uh, uh, nature. And I'm gonna show you more. I'm gonna develop that now. I think, uh, Julie, I'll move on, if Great. you don't mind, uh, to the next section, if I can find my bearings. Here I am. Here we are. Yes, now let, I want to explain about this hero of the Bund, a martyr of the Bund. Here, Schlecker. To that, I need to make a transition and explain. While the Bund was involved in labor organizing, it never believed that labor organizing was a panacea that, you know, through you can improve the lives of Jewish workers just through strikes. Ultimately, that was just a stepping stone towards the bigger arena of political struggle, of fighting the whole political system of a czar, of an autocracy. You know, I will remind you, Russia had no parliament of any kind in 1905, last country in Europe to even institute a parliament. It had um, no freedom of speech, no freedom of assembly. And uh, so the Bund becomes a revolutionary movement. That is, the, the real solution to problems is to bring down the whole regime, the whole system, and build something better on its ruins. Uh, of course, that's very... Um, uh, that you know that makes it a direct enemy of uh, the government of the state, and it was hounded. I mean, even having such a thing as a demonstration in the streets <clears throat> was very dangerous because uh, police, soldiers, Cossacks would all converge and beat up the demonstrators. <clears throat> That's the story of behind this person here, Schlecker. Uh, what happened was. The Bund had a demonstration on the streets of Vilna on May 1st, May, uh, the workers' holiday, May 1, 1902. Um, and the governor of Vilna uh, decided to teach them a lesson. They're walking down the streets with red flags, with um, Yiddish words on them, also Russian, but Yiddish and Russian. Um, and the governor decided he is going to, he rounds people up, he beats people. And then he did something quite extraordinary. Those who were arrested on that day, 
he took them to a town square and had them publicly whipped, stripped naked and publicly whipped. This created tremendous fury and anger. This had not been done. People had been sent to Siberia, people had been arrested, but publicly whipped, you know, naked in town square. And the Bund took this also in a very peculiar way. This happened not only because they were demonstrators against the autocracy, uh, uh, political opponents of the regime. This, if they had been Russians or Poles, this wouldn't have happened. They were treated like dogs because they were Jews. You're starting to see the development of the Jewish feature of the Bund. In other words, only Jews would be treated this way. And so there's an element of anti-Semitism as the Bund understood this event. And quietly the Bund, which usually did not support um, terrorist activity, meaning assassination of government officials, the Bund generally did not support a, a terrorist approach to bringing a revolution. But in this case, the Bund called for revenge. That says, um, and for the assassination of the governor of the Vilna province. And here Schleckert was a shoemaker, an illiterate or hardly literate Jewish shoemaker who got a gun and in 1902, I'm reminding you, it was quite early in the 20th century. There's no Haganah, uh, got a gun and uh, tried to assassinate the governor of Vilna. He was um, seized immediately, he failed. He only wounded the governor, he did not kill the governor. And a few weeks later, Leckert was hanged. Um, and he is the great martyr in the history of the Bund. And that event in 1902 is a really a landmark event for Russian Jews, really affected everyone. It was sort of the first time that a Jew picked up a gun for Jewish honor and uh, dignity. Um, yes, a lot of one of the struggles of this movement is the leadership is constantly changing because people are getting arrested. As soon as some people get, it's a very conspiratorial movement. Uh, what that means is people in the middle level of the movement don't even know personally the people at the top of the movement. Because if you get arrested and they ask you for names, you won't have a lot of names to give because you don't know most of the people. You have one contact. So um, the movement has struggles with the fact of its illegality. And this is a one famous figure. You can see him literally in change. Um, here I'm bringing in another leader of the movement, Vladimir Medem, the theoretician, a big theoretician of the Bund. The Bund becomes more and more Jewish with time. And what I mean by that is, um, Yes, they're a workers' movement. Yes, they're a revolutionary movement, but they become more of an avowedly Jewish movement that envisions a future where Jews will, in a future Russia, um, run their own communal affairs in a public way, uh, what they call cultural, national cultural autonomy. Medem is the person who advanced that idea that Jews in a future Russia should be recognized as a national group. And on the state budget, they should have Jewish public schools, Jewish publicly funded theaters, Jewish publicly funded libraries, Jewish publicly funded hospitals, that this is the vision of a future Jewish autonomy. Yiddish language should be recognized by the Russian state as one of the languages of Russia. What's so striking about this story is this man, Vladimir Medem, uh, uh, was born and raised as a Christian. His father had converted out, his father and mother. His father was a, a military officer, Jewish military officer, and you couldn't rise very high in the military as a Jew, so he converted out. It was, uh, Medem's only tie to Jewishness was his Jewish grandmother, who uh, cooked some Jewish foods and spoke some Yiddish, and so somewhere in the back of mind, he had an awareness as a child of uh, his being Jewish. And as a teenager, as he got drawn into socialism, he started meeting more Jews in the socialist movement. And eventually he embraced his Jewishness wholeheartedly, so wholeheartedly that he was the leader, leading thinker about this idea that the Jews are entitled to national autonomy in a future Russia. And I just want to stress because this might come up that um, 
the Bund had a terrible dispute on this matter with the leaders of the Russian Social Democratic Party, the, the main leader then being Vladimir Lenin. Lenin, uh, the Bund and Lenin should not be confused with each other. Uh, Bundists were never communists and Bundists were actually quite anti-communist. Lenin claimed that Jews should assimilate. Lenin claimed that it was harmful for Jews to retain their separateness. And, uh, in, and uh, it was Medim who fought Lenin saying, uh, no, Jews are a nation, Jews are a people and are entitled to perpetuate their language, their culture, their communal life. Yes, these are some examples of street demonstrations from the Russian um, period. There was a revolution in Russia in 1905. It, uh, it failed eventually. It was successful for about a year. And then by 1906, and certainly by 1907, uh, the autocracy reasserted itself. And, but you can see, uh, and, and at the same time as that revolution, you can, these are Bundes demonstrators in the midst of the revolution of 1905. Um, in the midst of that revolution, the counter-revolution, that is the regime and its supporters, instigated uh, pogroms against the Jews. Slogan actually was, we'll drown the revolution in Jewish blood. Uh, the idea was that all Jews are revolutionaries and the revolutionary movement is led by Jews. And therefore, if you're fighting the revolution, you know, kill the Jew, beat the Jews. The slogan was, beat the Jews and save Russia. And the Bund was instrumental, not alone, but definitely instrumental in the movement uh, to create Jewish self-defense units against pogroms. The quality of this picture isn't great, but the one thing you can see is a lot of them are carrying pistols and some of them knives. And um, while the first pogroms were often like slaughters, the famous pogrom in Kishinev in 1903, but many of the pogroms in 1905 and 1906 were more like street battles. They start out as pogroms and then they become street battles because um, the self-defense units um, fight back. And uh, yes, there are um, casualties and victims. And in a sense, the Bund took pride in their victims, right? In, in the sense of they fought and they fought and they died fighting. And that's why they make a group picture here of Bundes surrounding, you know, three of their members of a, of a self-defense unit who were killed, because this is now a matter of pride that Jews will um, fight. Socialist Zionists were also, it was really on the left that uh, the organization of Jewish self-defense, or actually they were just called in Russian by Avia Fiadi, fighting units, combat units, right, which really captures what they were. Is, Coalition, the social Zionists, and the Bund are the main ones. Um, so what you've seen here is a movement that initially was more about the working class has metamorphized and is now concerned about the Jewish people as a whole um, in defending Jews against pogroms, in assuring Jews um, a brighter future of national cultural autonomy. And that's um, Im important to stress. In fact, let me say this last point, um, that um, uh, the, the Bund was really not very popular when it was a labor movement. That is, it was very popular among workers, among Jewish workers, but most Jews were not workers in the technical sense of the term, that is a wage earner in a factory doing physical labor. Most Jews were, you know, uh, small tradesmen with a shop, with a stand, whatever. Um, so as a labor movement, the Bund was not extremely popular in Jewish society as a whole. They were creating divisions in Jewish society. But as a political movement, as a revolutionary movement, a movement fighting against the Tsar, they enjoyed a lot of popularity in the Jewish community. You didn't have to be a worker to, uh, if you were a Jew, you hated the czar and you hated the whole czarist regime and you admired those kids who did something about it. Um, and uh, all right, so I'm gonna, I think I'll stop there, but I've, I've really tried to develop the whole aspect of 
the political activity of the Bund at the turn of the 20th century. I'll take a break now for more questions. Okay, um, a few people asked about finances. So uh, for example, um, how, how are all of these activities, you know, printing the materials and that sort of thing funded? Um, was there a due structure of some kind? There was a due structure, but of course, uh, let's start with the basics, which is of course, workers don't have a lot of um, excess funds. For, so there were due structures and they're building strike funds, mainly strike funds with that. In order to strike, you gotta have a fund to keep people alive while they're on strike. As far as um, larger expenses, uh, first of all, they're getting help from America because a lot of their cousins and uh, friends have migrated to America and are doing somewhat better, enough that they can send um, money <clears throat> to the Bund in Russia. Um, and again, as far as the political activity, not so much the labor activity, the political activity, there's tremendous sympathy among non-working class Jews, meaning middle-class Jews, and Jewish intellectuals and professionals. Um, and so they can even get donations from people um, from the middle class to fund uh, this activity. You talk about relatives in America sending money. They were, they were sending money not, not only to support their, their own family members in Europe, but actually supporting the movement? Yes, exactly. In other words, um, <laughs> Many Jews migrate to America with these socialist ideas, right? They'll build the American Jewish labor movement, they'll build. And um, so they're not only sending money to help their personal family and friends, they're helping, they wanna help their communities and they wanna help their, their comrades uh, who share the ideals they do. So yes, a lot of money goes that way. Mm, okay, got it. Um, just kind of a, a general contextual question. Um, someone asked, what, what percentage of Jews were, were working in factories? You know, what percentage of Jews does this kind of uh, concern apply to? That's a great question. Let, let me say, um, yeah, I, 20, 25%, no more. Um, in other words, the definition of worker, or proletarian as socialists call it, um, is you gotta work for wages, you know, in a shop or in a factory. In other words, manual labor, usually mechanized, in other words, um, using some form of technology. Um, in, uh, right, and getting wages. So, you know, 20, 25% of the Jews fell into that. What's so, the Jewish economic structure is so strange because if you're a shoemaker and you have your own store, and you sell the shoes you make, well, <laughs> socialists will categorize you as petty bourgeois. You're a, a businessman. You have a store. You sell shoes. Um, but if you're a shoemaker and you work in a little factory to produce shoes, you know, and you're getting wages, then you're a worker. <laughs> um, so actually only a minority of Jews were technically speaking <laughs> um, workers. But I would say the majority of Jews were poor. And the majority of Jews were sympathetic. I'm only saying majority, not the vast majority. Majority were sympathetic to the idea of some kind of redistribution of wealth. In other words, in Russia, you know, where, where there are, is nobility with enormous estates and enormous land. And there are factory owners with, there are bankers. Now, so I'd say most, not necessarily Jewish ones, but there are. So I say most uh, Jews were poor and sympathize with an idea that at, in some time in the future, there has to be a significant redistribution of wealth, even if they weren't technically workers. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. So so if you're that if you're the shoemaker and you employ a few people, th those people who you employ see you as management or you sort of identify with the worker, where are you? <laughs> you've hit, you've hit the, the problem on the, uh, on the head, the nail on the head. From the Bund's perspective, if you're a shoemaker and you employ three people, you've now become management. You're now a businessman. You've now become the enemy. Um, uh, whereas, of course, uh, and, that, and that's what um, many critics of the Bund will say. Well, what's this labor movement stuff? 
you're you're pitting one pauper against another pauper. You think that this, you think that the the person that hires three shoemakers is, you know, some kind of capitalist. He's struggling to get by on his own. So that the critics of the Bund will definitely say that that this, um, uh, but Bundes will be pretty clear that you know, if you employ others, you become a capitalist. Uh, if anything, the new model should be cooperatives. That is workers collectively run the business. But once there's somebody making a profit, that's capitalism, even if you're really small. Right. Um, a few people asked about Zionism, and I'm not sure if you're already planning to address that later. That's fine. I'm okay. Um, so um, one person asked what what the what the conflicts were between the two movements. One person asked which which movement did the rabbis hate more, the Buddhists or the Zionists? <laughs> um, the Bund was anti-Zionist for many reasons. Um, the fundamental reason, which a lot of people shared at that time, was that Zionism is utopian. It will never happen it's a pipe dream. It's a waste of energy for something that will never, and even if it happens, what they mean by it will never happen is there's no way you're going to move the majority of uh, five and a half million Russian Jews to Palestine, All right? Maybe you can build something, but what does that do? You're never gonna get the majority over there. So the most fundamental idea was it is a distraction, a digression, um, the problem of, of, of Jews and the particularly the Jewish poor, has to be solved here. Um, there, were, um, there were other criticisms. Again, I'm talking, um, my whole talk today is until 1917. Um, so I'm not bringing in the Balfour Declaration, the British Mandate and all of that. Um, but um, another basic criticism is what are you going to accomplish? You're going to build up Palestine, the land of Israel, and you're going to just reestablish a capitalist system there all over again. You'll have, uh, so now you'll have Jewish workers working for Jewish capitalist businessmen in, um, and actually that criticism is actually what led to the rise of the socialist Zionist movement. Social Zionist movement came after the boom and it, it was trying to create a synthesis saying, no, 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 That's not like Theodore Herzl, we believe in building Eretz Yisrael on socialist foundations, on collective foundations, not on capitalist foundations. So the whole Polo the whole social Zionist movement was in a sense a response to this Bundes critique, which is you're just gonna create class, class oppression in the land of Israel the way we have it already in Russia. All right, I don't think that's enough to give you a sense of the ideological. Of course, uh, now the rabbis hated both movements, uh, definitely, I, I do think, uh, let me put it this way. There were rabbis who, there were some rabbis who participated in the Zionist movement. They're a minority. Um, you know, the religious Zionist movement Mizrahi, they're a minority and the vast majority of orthodoxy is anti-Zionist. But nonetheless, there was a religious wing of the Zionist movement. There is no religious wing of the Bund. No rabbi uh, <coughs> um, was a Bundist. So I, I guess I'd have to say that actually the rabbis, the rabbis were political conservatives, which is you work with the regime that exists. Um, you don't rock the boat. Jews are weak, Jews are few. And uh, if you create controversy, it will only backfire and hurt us. So the, 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 the rabbis thought Jews should keep a low political profile. And um, that applied to both movements, but in a sense it applied, in other words, Zionism, they also saw as sort of disrupting the existing political order of the world, which you're gonna go fight against the Turks. So, but the, even more so they thought that the Bund is a, you know, young, irresponsible troublemakers. You know, you, okay, I'll leave it at that. Do you wanna take more or go on? Okay, I'll take more. And I realize I did, we need to play a second song. We'll do that after oh. the questions. Um, so 
actually two different people asked about the um, Russo-Japanese War and oh, wow. uh, what impact it it had on the on the movement. Wow, that's a very educated question. Russo-Japanese War was in 1904, and what happened was Russia did not do well. Uh, it was a, a people expected Russia to trounce Japan and it did not happen. And in that sense, it showed that the czarist regime is not invincible. And uh, first of all, and it, it added only to the revolutionary fervor among young people that it's time for a change. Um, I think that's enough to say, you know, it, it, uh, it added to revolutionary fervor. But this regime is, it can't even win a war against Japan. Right. Um, and then uh, the maybe the last question for now, but several people raised it, was about uh, connections to uh, Marxism and, and Marx. Um, the Bund is a Marxist party. Uh, in other words, what that means is it believes fundamentally in the you know, class division of society and that a kind of progression from feudalism to capitalism to socialism, that uh, the, the workers and the, ca and the bourgeoisie, the middle class's interests are irreconcilable. Uh, so it is a Marxist party. What's unusual about it, well, for us only in, in Eastern Europe, it's not that unusual. What's interesting about it is it is both a Marxist and a Jewish nationalist movement at the same time. It brings together both a commitment to Jewry, to a Jewish life, Jewish culture, Jewish rights. Um, it doesn't uh, embrace assimilation. That's a dirty word for the Bund, assimilation. But at the same time, it, it does believe that in the matter, in economic matters, the Jewish workers and the Jewish middle class are uh, at loggerheads, but they are Marxists, no doubt about it. Um, uh, okay, I'd be clear about that. So, so maybe just to wrap that piece up. So one person asked specifically, um, and I, I don't think I want to say the name of this work because I'll almost certainly butcher it, but apparently Karl Marx um, wrote a work that, that um, Okay. That reflected unfavorably on on Jewish issues oh, that that create kind of a you know an internal conflict. Okay, Marx. One of his earliest, one of his younger youthful writings is an essay on the Jewish question. It is, in my opinion, and I think most opinions, not all agree. I think it's it's an anti-Semitic treatise. It, it you know what what is the God of Jew the Jews money, you know. Huckstering, profit. It's a terrible essay. Um, terrible, terrible essay. Um, <clears throat> what well, a few things need to be said about context. It's the young Marx, in other words, before he wrote any of his important works, the Communist Manifesto, Capital. Um, and actually, also importantly, the essay became an embarrassment for the Russian socialist and later communist movement. When the Soviets, for instance, reprinted that, uh, the, the collected works of Marx, they, out of embarrassment, deleted that essay. So that essay, terrible in its own right, does not have a long standing impact on uh, you know, socialism as it relates to the Jews. Um, it, um, I would just want to make that. Uh, clear. In general, the one segment of Russian society that was against anti-Semitism uh, were the socialists. Um, <clears throat> that is, um, the only segment of Russian society that admitted Jews into their midst were the Russian socialists. Uh, that pro the only segment that protested the pogroms well, not the only, but the most vocal and the most significant where the, was the Russian left. Um, so Marx's essay can be later revived and used, but it's not alive in the consciousness of, um, uh, of, of Russian socialists. 
socialists are for equality. And if there's one group that's being treated in Russia unequally, it is the Jews. And the, uh, the, everybody sees that. And so therefore, Russian socialists are the, the strongest voices against discrimination against the Jews. And even Lenin, yeah, Lenin is that also. And then later, Lenin will very famously say, um, the Jewish, um, the Jewish bourgeoisie, the Jewish businessman is our enemy, but the Jewish worker is our brother. We oppose the Jewish capitalist, not as a Jew, but as a capitalist. That's a, so um, that Lenin is saying that in 1917, 1918. In other words, very clear. Our battle is a class battle, but it is not a battle against Jews and many Jews are workers and et cetera. Okay, I think I've given a very comprehensive answer on that one. Great, thank you. So why don't we um, hear, hear the music you've sung? Yes, yes. Well, Tani's setting it up. I'll just explain what the this song is. Um, this is a political song. And it's saying, uh, by the way, music is very central to the Bund. It creates, as you know, in also in our religious service, singing together is a profound emotional experience. And for the Bund, singing together, whether it's in the safe house or in the forest or on the streets, is probably the moment, the biggest moment of their experience, right? And of course, there's a moment of vulnerability because as you sing out loud, you may be arrested, you may be attacked. Um, so the musical culture of the Bund is very important. This is actually a song saying, everybody go out and strike. This is a political strike. In other words, it's not about the employers, about we're gonna shut down the economy. And uh, down with the police, down with the czar and autocracy. And it's lots of different lines mocking the czar. Um, you know, used to be a garbage collector, let him go to hell, phrases like that. So it's really a, um, a song of political anger and a political call to arms. Okay, I hope that gave Tani time, time to find it. Um, I've only got a, a, 
a couple more slides and a couple more observations sort of to um, wrap things up. Um, <sighs> Okay, I've mentioned this, but I want to stress this. Bundes, by 1906 and 7, have become strong advocates of Yiddish language and culture. In the context, and, and you can see a, a, a Bundes woman as a delegate um, to the Chernovitz Conference for the Yiddish Language, Esther Frumkin, who we saw before. Um, in the context of Russia, what the Bund is mainly fighting is actually Russian. As Jews get more education, um, and as they become part of the big city life, more and more Jews are adopting Russian as their language, uh, reading in it, going to school in it. Um, and the Bund is actually very concerned about what it calls linguistic assimilation. And it actually says, you know, if a Jew has any self-respect, they should be leading their lives, uh, not in the language of the oppressor, but they should be leading their lives in the Jewish language, namely in Yiddish. And so the Bund becomes very um, important in this Yiddish movement, which is again, a kind of Jewish nationalism saying, Jews should live their lives as much as possible, definitely their internal and communal lives um, in their own language and not adopt a foreign language, the language of the oppressor. So the Bund is um, crucial uh, because again, the workers are mainly monolingual. They mainly know only um, Yiddish. The Bund wants Jewish workers to know some Russian, but they don't want, um, to be overwhelmed, them to be overwhelmed and simply embrace Russian culture. Um, that is connected with another thing I wanted to mention, which is, you know, there are many Jews who are just members of the general Russian revolutionary and socialist movement. Um, there are many Jews who are just working together with Lenin and the Russian Social Democrats. Most famous of them is Leon Trotsky. But there are many others, uh, Yuli Martov, Pavel Aksoro, the list is quite, quite long. Um, the Bund is opposed to these people. The Bund considers these people self-hating Jews because they consider themselves just Russian socialists. They basically deny their Jewish identity. The Bund is, uh, gets into a, a dispute with them because they say, ah, you know, Jewishness, who cares about that? We don't care about that. We're socialists, period. And the Bund is very firm in saying, um, no, we're socialists, but we're also Jews. And we should maintain our, our language, our culture, our communal um, existence. So that's a very important distinction to keep um, in, in mind. Um, to wrap this up, I have two or three sort of final um, observations, and of course I can answer more questions. Um, what did the Bund accomplish? Well, first of all, you know, it didn't control the world, right? So therefore the course of the Russian Revolution, the fact that the communists came to power in Russia is not the Bund's fault. When the, when the communists came to power in Russia in 1917, the Bund condemned it. Uh, the Bund uh, was always opposed to communism, to Bolshevism. So uh, history did not go the way Bund, the Bund want, expected it to go, wanted it to go. That's clear. So they were not political winners in that sense. Um, it, their legacy is in a couple of other areas, not in, in uh, successful politics. One is, they really did lift the morale of Jewish workers and more generally of Jews in Russia. Uh, being a worker, a Jewish worker in Russia was probably being like the lowest of the low in society. You're both a Jew and you're just, and even among Jews, you're just a worker. You're a menial laborer, you get nothing paid. Uh, you have no value. And this movement really 
created a sense among workers that I have dignity, I have value, I am an agent in history, I can actually do something to better my life. I don't have to be passive. I don't just have to take it, but I can. Uh, so it's a very important kind of psychological transformation to get a whole category of Jews that were rather passive and fatalistic to say, you know, I can do something and I'm worth something. So, and, and, and people now looked differently at Jewish workers because many of them were taking up guns against pogromists and many of them were heroically demonstrating in, in the streets. So that the whole status of Jewish workers um, changed thanks to them. Uh, that's one legacy. In other words, there's nothing worse for a group than to feel helpless, to feel there's nothing I can do. And the Bund was very successful in getting across to the lowest classes of Jews. No, there are things we can do and we're going to do them. They had no money. This is uh, getting back to finances. This is not a rich movement. This is a poor movement. The main thing they have is a lot of energy and a lot of volunteerism, a lot of, I mean, people are doing things not for pay. The Bund didn't have actually professional revolutionaries, people who made a living being a revolutionary. The Bund, so it's all about, that. that is the fundamental idea behind the Bund, that with, with little money, but with a lot of uh, grassroots voluntary effort and commitment, we, you know, our numbers can make a big difference, even if we are not, wealthy. So uh, it really brought in, that affected all of East European Jewry, I believe, that Elan, that sense that, you know, not every, because East European Jewry in general was poor, the idea that it's not all about money, that a lot of things can be accomplished through collective effort without money or with very little money. That becomes a very important theme in East European Jewish life beyond the Bund, you know, we can create schools and we can help them even if the salaries are low, we can, we can still do something important. We can create other institutions. Um, okay, that's uh, really a, the morale and the psychological aspect. Um, I'll go to the, 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 the last legacy, of course, is for us as American Jews. That is, it's not only that it directly moved to America, that's also true, that we had a tremendous American Jewish labor movement, which was a very part, big part of the labor movement in America. And, um, and that Jews really had a tremendous effect on uh, the creation of the New Deal and sort of the advancement of, of social justice in America. That's all true, but I'm gonna make it broader than that, which is, American jury, until this day, is a jury that is not shy about political activism. Um, it has on many occasions over the decades, you know, had demonstrations and it, uh, active lobbying of, of our Congress and our government. I just wanna stress that that is really a legacy from the Bund and from Eastern Europe. That is that you don't, you don't keep a low profile the way the rabbis wanted. You don't, you know, do only quiet diplomacy, but you proudly and vociferously make demands, voice your concerns. You don't sit on the sidelines. And the activism, the political activism of American Jewry owes a great deal to the political activism of our grandparents and great grandparents um, in Eastern Europe. We are the way we are, whatever we're doing, whether we're fighting for against racism and against anti-Semitism, or we're standing up for Israel, um, that, that very posture of um, we're going to openly say what we think and organize for our interests. Um, you know, whenever I see that, I think, well, that's thanks to our grandparents and our great grandparents uh, from Russia. Okay, I'll end on that thought. And if there are more observations or questions, be happy to answer. That's um, that's such a helpful and interesting context. The way you just ended, um, and um, I don't think that you mentioned 
Workman Circle specifically just now, but many, many people have asked about Workman Circle, which is connected, of course, to what you were just saying. So that was actually my, my teed up question um, for when you finished. Um, yes, the Workman Circle wasn't officially connected with the Bund, but it was, um, um, it was all created by people connected with the, who came, who are former Bundes who came to America. Um, Yes, the Workman Circle, first and foremost, and it's still around now, it's the Workers Circle, but it was a very powerful organization among the immigrants at the turn of the century, uh, very numerous. It was officially not a political organization, but a fraternal order. You know, it provided uh, medical benefits and uh, cultural services. Um, but the truth is, it and its orbit of organizations was a very, you know, it was the most uh, connected with the Workman Circle was the Yiddish paper, the Fallrats, um, which was the biggest Yiddish paper in America at the turn of the century. So that orbit of organizations um, had very tremendous impact. The Workman Circle sent a lot of money to the Bund in Russia uh, uh, in those uh, years and hosted Bundist guests and there's a lot of um, you know traffic back and forth between the workman circle in New York and the Bund in, in Russia. Okay and someone did actually just ask about about the forward. So maybe you could say another word about that. So so um, yeah can you just can you just elaborate on that a little bit and how oh, yeah. um, you understand the the immigrant milieu, the East European immigrant milieu was overwhelmingly a Yiddish language milieu. It took time for them to learn English and those who do, even though never felt quite as comfortable in it as they did in their native tongue. Um, so the Fauverts in the early 20th century has a daily circulation of 250,000. That's an enormous circulation. Um, so it's the most influential voice in the immigrant milieu in New York and it is, uh, it goes through many metamorphoses. Originally, it was, uh, I would just say, socialism in Yiddish, uh, in Yiddish translation. But with time, it it uh, changes. In other words, first of all, uh, by World War One, it's um, supportive of the Yishuv, that is, of the of of the labor movement in Palestine. And by the, you know, by, by the late, nine, by 1929, uh, it's, uh, you know, well, by the time FDR is on the, on the scene, they're supporting the FDR and the Democratic Party. And the, so they do shift from uh, the, let me just say, you know, queer left more to the center left over time. And they, uh, unlike the Bund, they're sympathetic to the, uh, enterprise in Eretz Yisrael. So um, they make their adaptations, but they're, uh, and of course the Fulverts is a great paper, had many great Yiddish writers write for it, had novels and serialization. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, both a political and a cultural um, presence. Um, I think that's what I'll say on the Fulverts. Great, thank you. Um, there was a follow-up to the, the Zionism comments that you made earlier and, and um, whether the kibbutz movement in, in um, I guess, Palestine was, right, you, you talked about the, the boon being sort of anti-Zionist or the, or the fundamental clash between the two because, you know, why we built a capitalist society somewhere else. So, you know, the kind of the socialist streak in Palestine, was there a connection there with the Bund or its philosophy? Um, there was the only connection. I think there is there's the connection. First of all, that all socialist Zionists, including the kibbutz movement, look to the Bund as their kind of parent movement or uncle. In other words, their predecessor. Often their predecessor that because they, the Bund came first before the kibbutz movement. A predecessor that made some basic mistakes, of course, because they weren't Zionists, but still they looked up to them. I showed you earlier a slide of a poem about Hirsch Leckert published in Hebrew, right? So in other words, Bundist heroes lived on 
even in the culture of the yeshuv, of the socialist Zionists in Eretz Yisrael. So um, there, there is respect for the Bund among socialist Zionists uh, in those days. Um, the kibbutzim, as I mentioned, socialist Zionism was largely a reaction against the Bund. In other words, you can be a Zionist and a socialist together. It's not um, Zionism or Bundism, as it had looked like it was in 1900 but you can be both a Zionist and a socialist. And that's the great genius of, of the kibbutz movement to create a synthesis, uh, if you want, between Bundist ideas and uh, Zionist ideas. Thank you. Um, all right, so different people here are, are um, positing theories as to um, what brought the ultimate end of, um, of the movement. And rather than sharing all their different theories, I'll just ask you what, what ultimately brought the end of the movement. Well, it depends what we're talking about. Um, if we're talking about the movement in Russia, that's simple. Um, the communists came to power in Russia. And they created a one party state in which the communist party was the only party and they liquidated all rival political parties, both Russian and also Jewish. So it's true, some Bundists did join the Communist Party in Russia. I can talk about the reasons why, but uh, most did not, and the Bund was simply liquidated. It was closed down in Russia, period, it, well, like all other uh, non-communist political parties. That happened in 1920. Um, but the Bund lived on in Poland, a separate state after World War I. Uh, there was a Bund in Poland, uh, I didn't really want to talk about the Bund and Poland between the two world wars, a whole other, other era, another chapter, another context. Um, in some ways, from my perspective, less heroic, less impressive. Uh, um, the problem the Bund had in Poland between the two world wars was they were so quiet, so obviously, socialists were so obviously a minority and in, in many ways a persecuted minority, they could have very little political impact. They could have very little political impact because parties of the center and the right were dominant, um, both among Jews and among Poles. But the Bund existed um, you know, down to the Holocaust and in the Holocaust. There were Bundist fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Um, uh, I imagine technically on paper, the Bund exists somewhere as an incorporated entity here in New York. But uh, I would say, I would say that the, the collapse socially of a Bundist ideology, it, it comes with the Holocaust. In other words, if you look at the DP camps after World War II, the survivor, the vast majority of survivors are saying, let us into Palestine, let us into Eretz Yisrael. There are Bundist groups, but they're much, uh, they're small, they're few and, and far between. In other words, the final crush of the Bund and the, uh, is the, the crushing blow to all of Jews Eastern Europe is the Holocaust, which also meant for most, you know, an end to that dream of a better future for Jews in Eastern Europe. The Holocaust is what made that for the vast majority of Jews no longer tenable. There can be a better future elsewhere. It can be in America, it can be in the land of Israel, but for the vast majority of Jews after the war, um, that dream now looks like an illusion, um, a very sad, tragic illusion. So that that's what I would say is, in, in historical terms, as far as its historical significance, um, that is the end of the Bund. Right. So it, it sounds like the um, you talked about the impact of of the movement here in America, um, and someone asked, you know, is there a legacy of it in in Russia or in in Europe? Um, you um, it doesn't. Uh -huh. uh -huh. In light of your question, it doesn't. In your answer, it doesn't seem like it. Uh, there is, but it's uh, it's real. Yes, there is, but there there is interest in the Bund among Jews who identify with the left in Europe. I 
gave a paper on the Bund at a conference. Now everything's remote, right? So it was based on a group in Genoa, Italy. And they're all Jew people who identify strongly as Jews, but are, you know, of the left in Italian politics. And they wanted to hear about the history of the Bund. I would say wherever there are Jews who are on the left, there is admiration of the Bund. Um, and it stands as some kind of symbol. Uh, um, uh, even if there's not a lot of knowledge, there, you know, there is a feeling for it. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, you know, its memory lives on um, in, uh, though I don't think quite the left is quite as popular in among European Jews, uh, but wherever there are Jews um, who are on the left, you know, they will, they will often invoke these songs and, and invoke this uh, history. Right. Someone actually noted that um, one of the one of the songs you shared with us had something like four hundred and fifty thousand views in the last ten years, or something like that. So, it, so it lives on as, as as inspiration, as you were just saying. Um, so, maybe just a just a small and quick question um, to wrap up with. Someone um, someone reminded me that that the title of your session referred to matzah bakers and talus weavers. And we talked, you talked about the matzah bakers. I don't know if we talked about the talus weavers. <laughs> about, throw in anything about them at the end. Um, oh, what's so cute is um, in Eastern Europe, there was one town, which was the capital city of talus making, Dubrovna, which is in Belarus. And Dubrovna is where they made talasim for all of Eastern Europe. And, um, but of course that once you have real shops and factories making talesim that's wonderful for the bund they come in and they organize and they yes and so the talus weavers of dubrovna this was a, this is like a national strike right when you shut down the making of talesim in one town you've shut down the making of talesim in all of the russian empire so yeah they won their strike the workers of dubrovna so interesting i never would have guessed they were all made in one one uh, place. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. I learned I learned so much, and I'm and I really, um, you know, the, the idea of this lasting inspiration and kind of the um, kind of giving birth to to American Jewish activism um, is is really a wonderful takeaway. Even though, as you said, um, they they didn't achieve the aims that they wanted in Europe. Um, but thank you so much for all of this nuance and detail and insight. Um, it was a wonderful lecture. We always are so happy when you teach us. We hope that you will come back for the next series. Um, I want to thank our, uh, our sponsor again, who, who sponsored today's session anonymously, and invite everyone back next week for our final session in the series. Uh, Professor Alan Cooper will be teaching that session, and we will kind of zoom way out and talk about um, you know, it says in Perkevo, Lo Alachaham Lacha Ligmor, the Loata Ben Chorinli Batel Mimena. It's not up to us to finish the work, but we also cannot abandon it. Um, and he'll be speaking about that to finish off our series. So I hope to see you, uh, hope to see everyone next week and happy last um, few hours of Hanukkah. Take care, everyone. <laughs>